welcome to this video and this was a talk that I gave at the 2021 STFC Introductory Astronomy Summer School and it was just an overview or introduction to stellar evolution and it briefly goes over most aspects of a solar-like star and a few other interesting things really. So it doesn't cover them in any detail, it just gives a broad overview of stellar evolution. So one of the most important things that we'll use throughout this journey of uh, stars evolutionary track is the HR diagram. So the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram is a plot of stars, it's observations of stars, and it's their luminosity plotted against their surface temperature. And you get this characteristic looking plot here. And the interesting thing here is that when you mark out the evolution of a star, you get a certain pathway. So for a solar-like star, they will kind of move on to the main sequence, back up again into the red giant phase, across as a planetary nebula then back down for a white dwarf. Now larger and less massive stars take a slightly different route but it would make it should make some intuitive sense why it moves the way it does so why the stars move across because they might get to hotter surface temperature they become more luminous less luminous so it makes a bit it should make some sense as we go through why they go the way that they do. So at the very beginning, we're going to start with the star formation process. Now on the left hand side, I've got a nice image of the Orion Nebula, which is a stellar nursery where stars have been forming. So I've pointed out a couple of bright blue stars there in the nebula. And on the right hand side, you've got a nice spiral galaxy. Now, star formation is assumed to occur in these giant molecular clouds. And those giant molecular clouds are almost exclusively confined to your spiral arms. And you can see some of those redder regions in the spiral arms of the actual galaxy, and they are corresponding to similar sort of structures to the Orion Nebula where these stars are forming. So we're going to assume that is our starting point. And for simplicity, actually, we assume the cloud is spherical, but we know that in the real world it's not, but it makes the mathematics and the assumptions much easier to understand. So let's take a spherical cloud, and it is stable when it's in hydrostatic equilibrium. So what that means is that your gravitational forces are being balanced by some outward gas pressure. So it's static, it's not collapsing and it's not expanding. However, at some point, one of those two forces may not equal the other. And in the case of a collapsing cloud, it means that the gravitational force overcomes this gas pressure. So you end up with a collapse. It becomes unstable to gravitational collapse and starts to collapse you then get a runaway contraction and it just keeps collapsing. But there is something that then will limit that collapse. So at some point, those forces are going to start to balance out again. That gas pressure increases and you're somewhat limited. And at that point there, we're getting close to the formation of a star at the center. Now, what we can do is we can mathematically work out an expression for the mass of a cloud at what point it would become unstable to this gravitational collapse. So it has to be a certain size for it to be unstable to gravitational collapse. So we can work out the gene's mass, which is the mass of a cloud where the thermal expansion energy is counteracted by gravitational forces causing the cloud to collapse. So if you've got a mass larger than this gene's mass, it means that it's going to be unstable to collapse. You can do the same thing for its actual radius. So the genes length or genes radius is the radius of a cloud, again, where the thermal expansion energy is counteracted by the gravitational forces, and therefore you get a collapse of the cloud. So if your genes length or radius is larger than this particular value, you're going to get a collapse of the cloud. Now to work that out, you can use this particular theorem. And this theorem is just an, an equation that relates the average total kinetic energy over time for a stable system of n particles, which is bound by potential forces, which are gravitational forces. So here you've got 2K, which is your gas kinetic energy, plus the gravitational potential energy, which equals zero. Now we, can, we know we have some expressions for those, so we can put them in. So on the left-hand side there, you've got the gas kinetic energy and then you have the gravitational potential energy. Now we want to work out m and r because that will be our genes radius and genes mass. Now I'm not going to do the full derivation here, uh, I've got other videos which go through those derivations in full 
Um, but if you do all of that and rearrange it, you should get an expression for the genes mass that looks a little bit like this. Now in that, you've only got two variables. So T is your temperature, that's the temperature of the cloud, and then you've got rho, which is your density. So they're the only two variables there. And if your genes mass is larger than this, sorry, your mass is larger than the genes mass, you're gonna get a collapse of the cloud. <clears throat> now what that actually tells you is that cool, dense regions are favorable to collapse. Because if our genes mass is proportional to the temperature to the power of three over two and the density to the power of minus one over two, then as the temperature increases, we need to have a larger genes mass. We need a larger cloud for it to be susceptible to collapse. And again, with the density, actually, as the density increases, our genes mass will decrease. So that tells us that cool, dense regions are going to be favourable to collapse. And the same is true, actually, if you look at the radius as well. So you, again, you only have that temperature and that density, and it just tells us that cold, dense clouds are going to be favourable to collapse. Now, we've just assumed that you've got this large spherical cloud that's collapsing to form a star. But again, in the real world, when we look out into space, we don't see that. You're not just going to get a large cloud collapse into a star. There's some fragmentation that's occurring. So stars forming in clusters. So something must be causing a process that causes that fragmentation of the cloud as it's collapsing. So here you've got this snake nebula. And if you look at that in different wavelengths, you can see that you've got clusters of stars occurring. You can see them zoomed in at different wavelengths on the right. But what's actually happening here is as that cloud is collapsing, it transitions from an isothermal collapse to an adiabatic collapse. So that means that that gravitational potential energy begins to be irradiated into the surroundings. And then at some point, the cloud becomes opaque and it's held within the actual cloud. So the cloud begins to heat up. And at that point, it becomes adiabatic. And that is one of the processes that can cause fragmentation. There's other things that's happening there as well, but this is part of it. Now, once we've got to this sort of stage, we've got a protostar. Now, these are not generating energy from hydrogen fusion in their core. Most of their energy has come from that gravitational collapse of the, of the cloud initially. So they're not quite hot enough to undergo that hydrogen fusion. They're not fully collapsed. So they are kind of, they're not in a, a fully hydrostatic equilibrium state at the moment. There's still some contraction there of the cloud and the protostar. But the interesting thing here is they're not on the HR diagram at the moment, but they kind of move left onto it. They come onto it from the right hand side. Now, depending on the mass of that protostar, it takes a slightly different route. So the smaller protostars, when they drop down onto the main sequence, they will actually take a more vertical route, whereas the larger ones, it's more horizontal. And that's to do with more of their size and their luminosity. So the, the bigger protostars are already quite close to the upper limit of luminosity, which we'll mention in a little bit. So the size denotes their absolute route they take on the HR diagram and onto the main sequence. Now, protostars are quite fast rotators. They're luminous and they're cool. They're luminous because they're actually quite large because they haven't fully collapsed yet and they have fairly cool surface temperatures. But because they're fast rotators, we've got this cloud of gas that had some kind of net rotation to start with. And as it's collapsed, to conserve that angular momentum, they actually have to rotate faster. So by collapsing, that moment of inertia has decreased. You've moved that mass towards the center of the rotation axis. So therefore, to keep your angular momentum the same, your angular velocity has to increase. So this is why our younger stars are typically going to be quite fast rotators. And you can see a video there, kind of giving in a visual ex example of that. Someone uh, who's ice skating and has their arms out and then they pull them in close, they can increase their rotational speed purely by doing that because the angular momentum hasn't changed, but because they've decreased their moment of inertia, their angular velocity does increase. And it's the same with stars. Now, stars on the main sequence are fusing hydrogen at their core. So they've got a central core, which is now at the right temperature to fuse hydrogen into helium. They're in hydrostatic equilibrium and they're quite happy sitting there 
for a fair chunk of their life really now depending on their mass it depends where they are in this main sequence so on the hr diagram you've got this diagonal right down the middle and the larger the star the higher up that they sit on that main sequence and the sun is kind of about a third of the way from the bottom really now there is a mass luminosity relationship so the bigger the star the more luminous it is but it's not as straightforward as just having a single relation there so what you actually have is for the smaller stars you've got this top expression here so you've basically got the mass is to the power of 2.3 and then for solar mass stars it's about to the power of four and then it changes again for stars greater than two solar masses up to quite large stars and at the very bottom your most massive stars have a different mass luminosity relation as well now what's actually causing or driving that particular relation well it's predominantly down to the energy transport mechanism so if it's convective or radiative, then it's going to impact their luminosity. So the energy transport mechanism impacts the opacity, so how opaque the star is. And that in turn alters your luminosity. Because if your star is quite transparent or quite opaque, it alters how luminous it is. So the actual energy coming from the surface. And it's down to the way that energy is transported internally. Now, why does that actually occur? Well, just to point out a couple of things that's occurring in the central core, which might give you an idea as to why you may have a, a convective core or a radiative core. So for solar mass stars like our sun, in their central core, the most dominant energy mechanism is from the proton-proton chain reaction. Now, the energy production rate from that particular reaction scales with temperature to the fourth power. So if you increase the temperature, then the energy production goes up um, by that amount. Now, in the larger stars, they're hot enough to actually have a, the dominant mechanism is the carbon, nitrogen, oxygen cycle. Now, that is a lot more sensitive to temperature. So if you increase the temperature, you increase the energy production by a lot more. So actually, it's to the 17th power this energy production rate as you increase the temperature. Now what that does is it causes a very large temperature gradient which then initiates um, the convection because of that temperature gradient. So actually it depends on the dominant energy production that's actually occurring in the star as to whether you get that or not. That then impacts how opaque the star is and then also the luminosity as well. So that's only a brief overview but it gives you an idea what's happening in the in the core and why it changes for different stars. Now with red giant stars, once they've finished the main sequence, they finish that hydrogen fusion in their core, most stars will go into a red giant phase. So they move off the main sequence to the right or to the upper right. But depending on the size of the star, they take a slightly different route. So solar mass stars, they almost go vertical up into this red giant phase. But the larger, more massive stars take a more horizontal route. So they just move to the right from where they were off the main sequence. Some of the very, very large stars actually don't have a red giant phase because they don't actually cool down enough to appear red. So they actually never get that red giant phase. Um, now, the reason why the larger stars don't get any more luminous, because they can get a cooler surface temperature, but they don't get any more luminous, is that they're already pretty close to the Eddington limit. So again, I've got another video that explains that in a little bit more detail. But on the left hand side there, you've got a star that is pretty close to the Eddington limit. Now, when stars get to that limit, they've almost got enough outward pressure to blow their outer layers off. So if, if the stars are too luminous, they can overcome their own gravitational forces. So that hydrostatic equilibrium becomes unbalanced again. So there's kind of a hard limit there <coughs> for the luminosity of the star. So why did it actually swell up at this point? Well, in the centre, they've no longer got a hydrogen core. They've got a helium core, which once the fusion stops, that collapses because there's no counteracting force for the, for the gravity. The helium core then heats up again. It allows some hydrogen back in and around a shell. So you've got some additional heat there. You've then got hydrogen in a shell around it, which is now at the right temperature to undergo fusion. So what happens is you have this hydrogen fusion fusing shell around the helium core 
that helium core, so that hydrogen core, actually has a larger volume than it originally did in the in the core beforehand. So it generates a larger outward pressure that then lifts the outer layers further out because it overcomes the gravitational force, which hasn't changed. So the star actually swells up because you've essentially changed the outward pressure instead. Now, red dwarf stars are at the bottom of the main sequence on the HR diagram, and these do not evolve into red giant stars. So these small stars never go into red giant phase. They will always stay as a red dwarf star. Now, why is that? Well, actually, they're fully convective. So if you look at the energy transport mechanism in a red dwarf star, the whole star is convective. So that means they never end up with a helium core. So they never have that stage where they have a hydrogen shell around the helium core that then undergoes the red giant phase. And because they're fully convective, it means that they actually survive on the main sequence the longest. So these will last a lot longer than other stars and they will never have that red giant phase. They'll slowly just cool down and that's it. They'd be done. Um, but it also means they're very efficient because they turn more of their hydrogen into helium because they're fully convective and they're circulating it all around in the, in the star. Now, when they're at, on this red giant phase, once they've moved off the main sequence, <clears throat> they go into this instability strip as well. So this is where you get these semi-regular semi pulsating stars. <clears throat> so stars here are physically pulsating and it can be regular, semi-regular, but the star will swell up, shrink back down, its surface temperature changes as well. So you can see by looking at the actual HR diagram that they, it's almost like a diagonal opposite to the main sequence. So as they swell up, they become more luminous, their surface temperature cools, and then they do it all over again. <clears throat> this happens because of a change in the, on how opaque the layers of the stars are. There's actually a few mechanisms occurring here, but predominantly it's due to how that energy is transported through the star. So it swells up, cools back down, and you get this nice cycle. And because they're regular, they can be quite useful for finding distances as well. So there's a period to luminosity relationship, which you can use. If you measure the period that the star is pulsating, you can work out how far away it is by measuring its magnitude or luminosity. And this is a typical light curve of one of these variable stars. Now the light curve is just the magnitude or luminosity of a star against time and you can see you've almost got a nice regular period there that you can easily pick out. Now whilst these stars are undergoing this particular process they do undergo a significant amount of mass loss so as they pulsate like this they can lose their outer layers and you've got a nice image of a star that is obviously moving through space but as it's doing so it's losing some of its outer layers and you can visually see the mass loss of these stars. So as they go through the red giant phase and in, go into the next stage of their evolution, they do lose a lot of mass. Now the next bit is they go from the red giant phase on the upper right of the HR diagram to a planetary nebula, which is across the top of the HR diagram. So here those outer layers are lost and then they're illuminated by the now hot exposed core. So you've got a nice planetary nebula there. And it's worth noting that these are not any, well, they're nothing to do with planets. It's just purely down to historical observations and what they were thought to look like when they were first observed. So they have nothing to do with planets, they're just called planetary nebulas. But it's these, now, these outer layers are lost and they do create a very beautiful looking structures. So you've got a couple more there. So these outer layers are then lost and then they're ionized by the exposed central core. So you've got a very hot central core of the star, which is now beginning to be exposed. That then illuminates or ionizes the outer layers, which is what gives you these beautiful looking structures and which then emit at their own wavelengths. So they become quite luminous at this point. And they obviously, their surface temperatures increase because we can now see their, their central cores, which is why they take that route across the HR diagram. Now, once they've done that, the planetary nebula dissipates. It then leaves this exposed carbon core, or carbon oxygen core, 
and it will move down into the white dwarf group. So they become less luminous because those outer layers have been lost. You've only got that very small central core left. So yes, they have very high surface temperatures, but because they're very small, their luminosity is not that great. So that's why they come down on the HR diagram. Now the white dwarf stars are typically planetary size. So this is an illustration of the smallest one discovered so far, which is a little bit bigger than our moon. They have very high surface temperatures because if you think about it, it is basically the central core of a star. Um, but they generally are planetary size, so terrestrial planet size as a general rule. And they're mostly made of carbon and oxygen because that's what's left behind from a solar-like star once it's finished the end of its fusion part of its life, really. Now here what's holding them together because they've actually collapsed and you've now got this degenerate star which means that there was then nothing there's no outward pressure holding the star together <clears throat> you've got that gravitational force which is still there so that gravitational force collapses the star and the only thing supporting it now is this electron degeneracy pressure so this is where the electrons are forced into their ground state this then causes a pressure that can support itself against gra the gravitational forces. So here you've actually got the distributions of known white dwarfs. So on the right hand side you can see that actually if you look at white dwarfs they have a, a typical peak around 0.6 solar masses. Now it's worth noting that because it's the central core of the star that's left behind it doesn't mean that the star originally was 0.6 solar masses. It would have been a bit bigger. So it would have been probably bigger than the sun. But this distribution is most likely down to the fact of the stars that were you know, populating the universe at the time, as opposed to the white dwarfs themselves. And then on the left-hand side, you can see how the radius of the white dwarf changes as the mass increases to the point when you get to about 1.4 solar masses, and then you get a sudden shrinking again or collapse. And there's an upper limit, which is about 1.44 solar masses. And at that point there, the electron degeneracy pressure is not able to support against the gravitational forces and you get a further collapse. So you have this limit again, 1.44 solar masses. That's the upper limit for the mass of a white dwarf. Now, the interesting thing actually is that planets have been found orbiting and also polluting the spectrum of white dwarf stars. So if we've got planets orbiting them, even if they're being destroyed, it means they have survived the planetary nebula phase, the red giant phase, to then be still orbiting the white dwarf, which is quite interesting and exciting, really, because it has implications for our own solar system going forward. Now, if your star is larger than you know, the sun, or a bit, bit larger than that, more so, or larger than that 1.4 solar masses when it's actually ended its life, then you're going to end up with a neutron star or pulsar. Now, they're kind of one and the same thing. So, all pulsars are neutron stars, but not all, not all neutron stars are pulsars, and it could be down to the way that we, we observe them. So, these pulsars have a beam of light, not light, they have a beam of that we can pick up and we get a pulse every rotation or every we get two every rotation depending on how it's actually orientated um, but at this point here these are held up against the gravitational force by neutron degeneracy pressure instead and this is where your electrons are then forced into the protons to form neutrons and it's thought that there's an upper limit of about 2.1 solar masses again there's a bit of uncertainty there and we don't have a lot of observations at that upper limit as well. So it's mostly theoretical. And then if you have larger stellar remnants than that, then you're likely going to get a black hole. Now, there's a lot of unknowns about black holes because you can't just directly observe them. But they do have the, this event horizon. And if you have a rotating black hole oh, on the right hand side, I've got a bit of a diagram there. That, so you end up with multiple horizons. You have an outer horizon, inner horizon. You then also have this ergosphere, which is where you're able to take rotational energy out of the black hole as well. But I'll not mention much about them. The only thing worth noting is that there is an upper limit on black holes, or thought to be, 
and it's about 10 to the 10 solar masses. These are not stellar black holes, uh, which is probably worth noting. And you can have black holes in a whole range of masses. Stellar black holes have to be formed from the death of a star, so they're going to have a very particular range. But these, mo these supermassive black holes are in the centre of galaxies, and they almost self-limit their mass, because when they get so large, they're drawing in gas from all over the galaxy. It's funneled in, and once when they take so much gas, you get star formation occurring in that gas. That then causes a bit of a feedback, and it limits the amount that they can actually grow by. So if you want to have a look at the general overview of stellar evolution, it's purely down to mass, really, their starting mass. So low mass stars, they go nebula, main sequence, red giant, planetary nebula, white dwarf. That's kind of what our sun will do. And then the larger ones will do a similar sort of thing, but they will have a, a supernova and they'll end up with a neutron star or a black hole, depending on their, their mass. And it's just purely down to how, how large the, or massive the star is. Now, it's worth noting that not all supernovas are created equal. So you have type 1 and type 2. There's a lot of subcategories in there. And the two I've picked out here just to show you is the type 1a and the type 2. So the type 2 is from the death of a large star. It's a singular event with a single star. And then a type 1a is actually from a binary system of a white dwarf and a red giant star. Uh, it's a very specific supernova, and they're, they're quite different. So they're mostly characterised by their spectrum. So type 1, you don't get any hydrogen. It's a thermonuclear explosion, and you don't get a stellar remnant at the end. So the whole star uh, environment is destroyed. Type 2, you do see hydrogen in their spectrum. It's from the core collapse of a large star at the end of its life, and you do end up with a stellar remnant, most likely a neutron star or a black hole. Now, the type two, this is from your death of the massive star. Your core suddenly collapses when your fusion ceases at the center. So there's no longer that outward pressure supporting the gravitational force. So what happens is you get a sudden collapse. It overshoots this neutron degeneracy pressure, and you get a rebound with a shock wave that then propagates outwards through all the outer layers, and that then is the basis for a supernova or a type 2 supernova. They're not all the same because it depends on their mass and their composition and things like that. Type 1a, so here you've actually got a red giant white dwarf binary system. And what happens is the white dwarf is drawing material off the red giant, and that white dwarf then approaches the ignition temperature of carbon. And then it just detonates and you get a type 1a supernova. And it always happens with around about 1.4 solar masses, that upper limit for a white dwarf. So once you hit that mass limit, you get a runaway um, detonation of, of the carbon that it's made of. Now, the good thing about the type 1a is they supposedly all happen at the same mass, so the same energy. Therefore, the same luminosity, same magnitude. And you can then use them to work a distance to the star. So we can use this, this equation here. So you have the apparent magnitude, which is what we would measure. That's what we would observe. The absolute magnitude is what it would be from some set distance. So the absolute magnitude would always be the same. The apparent magnitude would change depending on how far away it would be. And then we can work a distance to it in parsecs. So here you've actually got the light curve of a type 1a supernova. So that plot there just shows you how bright it gets from when it first occurs. And you've got one occurring in the galaxy on the right there. And they can be quite bright. And then over time, the, the, it will peak in a few days, and then it will slowly dim down. And the apparent magnitude is on your y-axis, and obviously your time is on your x. Now the peak absolute magnitude of type 1a is about minus 19.5 and we can see from the light curve if we take the peak there it's around about 12 which would be our apparent magnitude and if you put that into your equation you can work out a distance to it now the type 1a light curves pretty much all have the same shape you might have to do some kind of um, correction for it so some stretch but basically they all have the same shape now, the type 2s wouldn't necessarily have the same shape. 
because they're not all the same mass, they're not always the same competition, composition, so there are variations there, whereas type 1a should all have this similar shape to the light curve. Now finally, we just have an example of a type 1a that's not a type 1a. So here you've actually got the merger of two white dwarfs. Now they could have a, a combined mass that is greater than 1.4 solar masses, so therefore, it could appear to be type 1a, but you've actually exceeded that 1.4 upper limit. So therefore, it's it's not the same. So there's some care needs to be taken when looking at these type 1a supernovas because there are other scenarios that can occur that look similar. And also, during one of these sorts of events, you may end up with a remnant at the end. So what might be noted as a zombie star, the what not all of the white dwarf has been destroyed, so some of it survives that supernova, only left with kind of smaller parts, which we might want to refer to as a zombie star. So, thank you for watching, and if you enjoyed, you can check out some of the other videos where some of the things I mentioned in this video, there are more detailed derivations or discussions on the topics that were covered. So, thank you.